Hi guys, Matt from Haltech here, and today on Technically Speaking, we're gonna get the lowdown on ECU grounding. Now if you follow any online forum where vehicle wiring is discussed, it won't take long before you come across the debate about the best way to ground your ECU. So today, we're gonna get our nerd on and we're gonna look at the theory of electronic circuits and help you figure out the optimal grounding solution for your particular wiring application. First up, let's look at some of the problems that we're trying to avoid, how to analyze them, and then we'll discuss how to optimize the ground layout for each particular case. Now the fundamental rule that applies to any electrical circuit is just that, it's a circuit, in that it's a complete loop. We've got one side that's the battery that has the power supply, there's a device in the middle that we're controlling or the sensor that we're reading a value from, and then there's a ground. Now, the ground completes the circuit loop back to the battery. In an automotive system, we get smart and we say, wait a minute, this whole vehicle is made of metal and therefore it conducts electricity. So rather than running two wires to every device, let's put a wire between the battery negative and the vehicle chassis, and now the whole vehicle is effectively a return loop. It's a wire that goes back to the battery, and that allows current to flow from the device all the way back to the battery. Now this is where things start to get confusing for some people. Because in our ECU wiring harness, we've also got ground wires. We've got battery ground wires, and we separate out signal ground wires. And it's easy to look at these wires and say, oh okay, ground's ground, it just loops back to the battery. So I should be able to connect all the black wires to chassis anywhere and everywhere, right? Well, yeah that's possible, but no, you really shouldn't do it. Now to analyze any electrical system, I find the easiest thing to do is draw a rough diagram of it first. Remember that every wire in the system can carry current and every wire has a different resistance, which means you're going to get a different voltage drop across each wire. And that voltage drop varies depending on the length of the wire, the gauge of the wire, how much resistance there is in the wire, the number of joins in the wire, and the amount of current flowing through the wire. Now since we're talking about this in the context of ECU grounding, let's look at the voltage from the ECU's perspective, and then we'll predict what can go wrong due to different voltage drops. So in this first example, we've grounded the ECU to the engine, but also to the battery. I actually see this quite a bit for some reason. I guess it's because people see ground straps on both the battery and the block and the chassis, and they think to themselves, well, if one ground is good, two grounds is better. Or Perhaps in the past they bought one of those eBay grounding kits and they made that extra 15 horsepower that was promised and so now they're just in the habit of putting ground lugs on everything and anything. Whatever people's reasoning for this, I see it a lot. So let's take a look at the problems that this can cause. First up, during cranking, a lot of current flows through the ground strap between the engine and the battery. So there's a voltage drop between the engine and the battery. When you've got multiple ground wires now, that connect between the same two points, the current's shared between two alternate ground paths. Or in other words, the ECU wiring shares some of that starter motor current. Exactly how much depends on the relative resistances between the ECU ground strap and the chassis ground strap. If you've got a good ground strap between the engine and the chassis, then it's not a lot that goes through the ECU. But if you've forgotten to tighten up that bolt, or you painted the block underneath, or maybe it's just not making good contact for whatever reason, now a lot of that starter motor current gets carried by the ECU wires. That can let the smoke out. This is bad. Now another similar but different example we often see is where the sensor ground is externally grounded. Because the ECU is already grounded through the power ground wire, we're now creating a parallel ground path again, and a similar thing occurs to what happens with the starter motor but in a less extreme way. What happens here is when the injector duty cycle increases, the average ground current from the ECU also increases, and therefore so with a voltage drop between the ECU and the battery. Creating this alternate ground path for the sensors gives us a different voltage drop, and that offsets the output reading of any sensor that's connected to the alternate ground path. So now you get erratic sensor readings. That's not a good thing. And in this last example, a car's got a coil on plug ignition. Now the coils are grounded to the engine, but the ECU is grounded instead to the battery. As the engine speed increases, the alternator charge current increases, 
so the voltage drop between the engine and the battery increases also. Now let's assume that the grounding to the ECU from the battery is also yeah, a little bit iffy, which means as the injector duty cycle increases, the voltage drop between the ECU and the battery also increases. Now we've got a double problem, which causes the ECU ground to sit higher than the engine ground. The coils, however, are grounded to the engine still, which means when the ECU is outputting what it thinks is zero volts to the ignition, the coil actually sees a positive charge, which is equal to the voltage drop that's across the ECU to the battery. Now some coils with built-in igniters only need as little as half a volt to trigger, which means in extreme cases you could actually get the coils triggering by themselves. That's bad, always bad. In all three of these examples, the problem is common impedance paths or common grounds. The way around this is star point grounding. You pick a single point for your ground and you reference all your grounds to that point. With what I've just described, it doesn't really matter whether this point is the engine or the chassis or battery negative, but there's some other factors, which I'll explain in a second. For your sensors though, you only ever want to use the signal ground that is supplied from the ECU. That's why this wire exists. Don't be lazy and just run a wire from the sensor looped around to the engine. Use the dedicated sensor ground wire. Now, there are circumstances where a sensor's ground is not isolated from the body of the sensor and it has to screw into the engine for its ground. So, for example, some cam angle sensors work like this. Narrowband oxygen sensors and a lot of NOx sensors, they actually ground through the body of the sensor so there's not a separate wire. In this case, you've got a choice. You could replace this sensor with one that's got a separate ground wire that is separated from the body, or you choose a star point grounding location that is on the engine. So, that's the question. What's the best location for your star point grounding? Well, if it's me doing the wiring, I'll always choose the cylinder head because it minimizes the likelihood of a voltage drop causing those random ignition events. And it also allows for these sensors that are grounded through the body of the sensor themselves to be used in their native form. So there you have it, the lowdown on grounding. If you've got any questions, shoot us an email on support at haltech.com. I'm Matt from Haltech, and I'll see you next time.